This module is going to cover some advanced mail flow scenarios for Exchange 2016. We're going to look at three concepts, each of which has some overlap with the others. First, we'll look at using transport rules to control mail flow. After that, we're going to examine the concept of a shared SMTP namespace. Finally, we'll look at how message size restrictions apply to Exchange 2016 environments. So first, let's take a look at transport rules. You might encounter some places that refer to transport rules as mail flow rules. Well, they're the same thing, and I think mail flow rules just makes more sense to some people because mail flow is an easy concept to understand, whereas transport is a little bit vague. Transport rules look for messages that match specific criteria or conditions, and then take action on those messages. It's basically as simple as that, but at the same time, incredibly powerful. Transport rules are configured for an organization, but will only apply to messages that match the rules specific conditions. Transport rule conditions cover a broad range of message characteristics. Transport rules can look for messages based on the sender details, the recipient details, the message contents, and if you want to see the full set of conditions, that's available on TechNet and it is well worth reading because it gives you a lot of ideas about ways that you can apply transport rules in your own organization. The transport rule actions include such things as forwarding or redirecting a message, rejecting or deleting a message, adding recipients to a message, applying rights management or encryption, modifying the spam score, or setting any header values that you might need to. And again, the full list of transport rule actions is available on TechNet and it's well worth reading. With only a few exceptions about which conditions and actions can be combined with each other, there's a vast range of transport rule configurations that you can apply. Some examples include ethical walls. For example, if you need to prevent a research and development department from communicating directly with the sales department of an organization. Moderating email messages is also very popular. You can use this to hold a message until, for example, a sender's manager is able to review and approve it. And another common use is applying an email disclaimer. Well, Globomantics has asked Dave, the systems engineer, to configure an email disclaimer for the organization. So let's go into the Globomantics environment and have a look at configuring transport rules. In the Exchange Admin Center, Mailflow rules or transport rules can be found in the Mailflow section under Rules. And when we're creating a new rule, we have the option to create one from what is basically a blank template or we'll use one of a series of other templates that are available for more specific scenarios. Now the outcome is always the same. You can get the same outcome, for example, applying a disclaimer by creating a rule from the blank template or from starting from any other template. These templates just make things a little bit easier by pre-configuring some of the options for you. So in the case of Globomantics, let's choose apply disclaimers. For this email disclaimer, it's going to be applied to all outbound messages to external recipients. So the conditions we're looking for is if the recipient is located outside of the organization and the action is to apply the disclaimer text. There is a fallback action. If the text can't be added, We'll just choose the default of wrap in that case. And one of the things to consider with email disclaimers is that if an email conversation is going back and forth between an internal and an external recipient, we don't want the disclaimer added every single time, just on the initial message that is sent out of the organization. So let's expand more options and we can add an exception to this rule for if the subject or body includes any of these words and we'll just add in the full text of the disclaimer again which should have the effect of adding the disclaimer only if the recipient is outside the organization append the disclaimer 
unless the disclaimer text is already found in the subject or body. So now that that message has been saved, it will take effect for the entire organization. So let's give that a test from Adam Wally's mailbox. We'll send another email to the Gmail test account. And now that the email has arrived, we can see that that disclaimer text has been automatically added. So with that transport rule in effect, Globemantics now has a disclaimer added to all of their outbound emails automatically. Now let's look at a typical shared SMTP namespace. As an example, let's consider the Globemantics environment and the separate Wired Brain Coffee brand that is being spun off into their own organization. The new environment for Wired Brain Coffee has been built, but there's going to be a period of time during the migration that some Wired Brain users and their mailboxes are still in the Globemantics organization. The Globemantics Exchange organization needs two accepted domains. Globemantics.biz is the authoritative domain for Globemantics, and WiredBrainCoffee.biz is the internal relay domain being shared with Wired Brain Coffee. In the Wired Brain Coffee Exchange organization, only the WiredBrainCoffee.biz domain name is needed, but it also needs to be an internal relay domain. So now when an email for a Wired Brain Coffee user arrives in the Globemantics organization, Exchange will first look for a local recipient. If no local recipient is found, the mail will route to the Wired Brain Coffee organization. A send connector that can route to that destination will be required. The Wired Brain Coffee Exchange server will deliver the message to the local recipient if they exist. Now consider what might happen if the Wired Brain Coffee environment also doesn't have a recipient that matches the address the email was sent to. Since this is an internal relay domain, Wired Brain Coffee should route any email that it doesn't have a local recipient for back over to the Globemantics organization. That's how you'd expect it to work because the users already migrated to Wired Brain Coffee still need to be able to email their colleagues who are still in the Globemantics organization. Well, what's going to happen since neither organization actually has a recipient for this particular message is an infinite loop will occur. That is, unless a transport rule is added to each organization to detect loops and break them. So our good friend Dave, the systems engineer for Globemantics, needs to get this shared SMTP namespace working and without any infinite loops. So let's go back into the demo environment and look at configuring a shared SMTP namespace. In the Exchange Admin Center, navigate to the Mailflow section and then have a look at accepted domains. So widebraincoffee.biz was originally added as an authoritative domain. It needs to be converted into an internal relay domain because it is now a shared SMTP namespace with the Widebrain Coffee organization. Globemantics then needs a send connector for routing email to that organization. So it's as simple as creating a new send connector and specifying a smart host. We'll use the DNS name of the Widebrain Coffee mail server. The address space for the send connector is Wired Brain Coffee. So this is what tells the send connector to work only for the widebraincoffee.biz domain. And the source servers in this case should be the mailbox servers. And we'll just choose the mailbox servers in San Francisco. With that configuration in place, we've established mail flow for widebraincoffee.biz over to the Wired Brain Coffee organization. But now we need to consider that infinite loop scenario. And what we can do here is configure two transport rules that will detect and break message loops that might be occurring. The first is to add a header that will be used for loop detection. 
For any email coming into the Globemantics organization that is to a widebraincoffee.biz recipient address, we're going to set a message header called X loop. And it will be set to a value of Globomantics. Next, we add a second rule. Clicking the More Options link brings more of the available conditions to the surface that we can use. And we're looking for messages with a message header of X loop containing the word Globomantics. The action to take on any of those messages is to reject the message and specify a rejection reason of loop detected. These transport rules will be assessed in order. We want to check for the Globomantics header first. So that rule needs to be moved up in the priority order. This way, if a message enters the organization and it already has the X loop header set, indicating that it's already passed through this organization at least once, the message will be rejected. If it hasn't passed through this organization already, the next rule will add the X loop header only if the recipient is a widebraincoffee.biz domain. So if that mail was then to route over to Widebrain Coffee, and they didn't have a local recipient, the mail was sent back to this organization, the header would be detected and the loop would be broken. If these rules weren't put in place in a shared SMTP namespace scenario, an infinite loop would occur. However, Exchange is intelligent enough to detect infinite loops, but it takes about 30 loops before that detection actually kicks in and drops the message. And that'll cause delays and perhaps excessive email traffic especially if your organization is getting spammed to a large number of invalid addresses. As the final piece of the puzzle, because the domain is now an internal relay domain, the address book enabled property needs to be set to false so that edge transport servers no longer try to perform recipient filtering for this domain. For the final part of this module, let's look at message size limits. Message size limits refers to the total size of an email message. So that is the message itself, plus attachments, plus various overheads as the message travels through the transport pipeline. The default message size limit is 10 megabytes, which amounts to an attachment of around eight megabytes and an average size message and then those overheads that are referred to. Message size limits aren't just about the size of the message in the attachment though. You can also limit the number of recipients that an email message is sent to. The default is 500 recipients. An important point to remember here is that a distribution group counts as one recipient, even if that distribution group has thousands of individual members. Message size limits can be configured at the organizational level, which applies to all of the exchange servers in the organization. Limits can also be applied at the connector level. Individual limits can be applied on a per connector basis for receive connectors, send connectors, and active directory site connectors. This allows you to limit attachment sizes over low bandwidth links if you need to. Message size limits can also be applied at the server level. These will apply to mobile and web users and need to be configured by editing an XML file on the server. It might seem logical to match the server limits to the organization limits, but web and mobile users are often connecting over poor bandwidth, so limiting their message size can be a good thing. Finally, you can apply message size limits to individual recipients such as mailboxes and distribution groups. An ideal use of recipient limits is to prevent anyone from sending an attachment to a very large distribution group. The most restrictive size limit is the one that wins. So it's recommended to place the most restrictive size limit closest to the sender. This means that if you have an organization limit of 10 megabytes, there's little point in having a receive connector limit of 50 megabytes. 
it's better to reject the oversized message at the connector level before it gets into the transport pipeline and needs to be processed any further. It quickly gets complicated though, trying to manage lots of different limits and how they might impact malflow in different ways. So it's much easier to just set the same limits everywhere. However, authenticated senders can have a higher limit configured if you wish, but it will only work for sending to other internal recipients. This is useful if you have a system mailbox that needs to accept very large data files for automatic processing. Message size limits relate to transport rules because transport rules can take action based on the message size or the size of individual attachments. This provides much more granular control. For example, instead of limiting a distribution group to receiving messages of a fixed size, you can limit it for most users except for a few approved senders. Similarly, you could apply moderation for messages over a certain size or base your size restrictions on the size of individual attachments rather than the total size of the whole message. Message size limits also need to be carefully considered for shared SMTP namespaces. Ideally, both organizations for a shared namespace will have the same message size limits. This avoids issues where one organization that first receives the message might reject it due to the size, even though the other organization that actually has the recipient that the message was addressed to would have accepted that size message. So let's return to the Globomantics environment and look at configuring message size limits. To configure the organization level size limits, we run the set transport config commandlet and set the max receive size, let's say 50 megabytes, and max send size also to 50 megabytes. Next, let's have a look at all the receive connectors in the environment. We'll just grab the names and their max message size properties. Currently, they're all set to the default of 35 or 36 megabytes, depending on the connector. So let's use get receive connector and we'll pipe that to set receive connector and set them all to 50 megabytes as well to match the organization limit. Now with that large a message size limit in the organization, there is the risk that someone could send a very large email attachment to a large distribution group, such as the all staff distribution group for the organization. So they're interested in preventing that from causing a problem with the exchange servers. The way to do that would be to use a transport rule that will filter messages by size. So the goal of this transport rule is to moderate large messages sent to the all staff distribution group. Let's consider four megabytes to be a large message and we need to add an additional condition if the recipient address includes the email address of the all staff group. You might wonder why we didn't choose the condition the recipient is this person. And the reason for that is that transport rules don't allow you to use that condition in combination with a distribution group. If you try, you'll get an error that that combination can't be used. The action that should take place is to forward the message for approval and we'll get those messages forwarded over to Dave. And he can take a look at them and decide whether they should be approved for delivery to every recipient in the organization who's a member of that all staff group. Now, if there were some people who should be automatically approved, they are authorized to send large attachments to that group, they could be added in as an exception to this rule and then that moderation process would not occur. For now, let's just save that rule. Pretty happy with those conditions. And now we know that even though the organizational limit is 50 megabytes, we're not at risk of a server issue from someone sending large email attachments to all staff at once. So to wrap up this module, we looked at how transport rules can be used to control mail flow in an exchange organization, how a shared SMTP namespace operates, and where message size limits can be applied. Coming up in the last module of this course, 
we'll look at high availability and site resilience for transport.